the me and my Bible is a, is a product again of the enlightenment, of the questioning of all tradition, and these tr creeds are part of the man-made tradition. Um, it emerges in the kind of individualism of the West, the failure to realize that Christianity is a confession of a community. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. For example, it's a, it's a communal confession. Uh, the early church would recite this confession communally. Welcome to the Crossway Podcast, a show where we sit down with authors each week for thoughtful interviews about the Bible, theology, church history, and the Christian life. I'm Matt Tully, and today I'm talking with Michael Haken. Michael serves as professor of church history and biblical spirituality at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and director of the Andrew Fuller Center for Baptist Studies. He's also the author of Rediscovering the Church Fathers, Who They Were and How They Shaped the Church from Crossway. Today, Michael and I discuss what we can learn from the early church fathers today. He reflects on what we should make of the early church's allegorical reading of the Bible, the value of early Christian creeds for helping to define our faith today, and where to start if someone is interested in reading the church fathers for him or herself. Let's get started. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on the Crossway Podcast today. It's great to be here. So what is meant when someone refers to the church fathers? Uh, who would be considered part of that group? Uh, the Church Fathers really uh, begin in the year roughly 100, so right at the end of the Apostolic period when the uh, New Testament has been written. So the first Church Fathers would be figures like Ignatius of Antioch, who wrote seven letters on his way to martyrdom, roughly around 107 to 110. Uh, Clement of Rome, who is the author of uh, what we call First Clement. Uh, Second Clement is attributed to him, but it's not him. It's a different author. So he's around the same time, late 90s. And then the, the big challenge is trying to uh, kind of determine a uh, terminus uh, for this era. Uh, traditionally, the way I would have been taught it back in the 80s, is that the Church Fathers run up to roughly 500, Gregory the Great. Uh, my own uh, convictions over the years uh, have changed. The pioneering work that somebody like Peter Brown did on establishing what we call late antiquity, roughly 200, 250 to around 650, 700. That period between the, uh, col the decline, collapse of the Roman Empire and the emergence of Islam um, has shaped my own thinking. Mm. So that it's, it's, it's really the breakout of Islam out of the Saudi Peninsula that radically changes the kind of framework of, of what had been the early church, which had been basically built around both shores of the Mediterranean. And so I would actually take the, the Church Fathers up to the time of uh, Bede, who dies in 735 in northern England, in Northumbria, or John of Damascus, roughly the same period, uh, an Arab Christian living in Damascus under Muslim rule, um, who is writing a synthesis of patristic thought or the thought of the early fathers. Mm. So roughly then 100 to about 700. Yeah, it's fascinating. I think a lot of us, we, we tend to think of uh, Christian-Muslim relations and kind of the, the intersection of those two religions in current times often, but sometimes we forget that uh, going back to the early church, uh, that was a real dynamic happening in uh, the later part of, of that. Yeah, uh, Islam is... Um, uh, from the classical Christian understanding of Islam, Islam's a heresy. It's not a new religion. Um, it's a uh, heretical response to the revelation that we have in the Old Testament, New Testament with uh, Christ. And a lot of the theological questions that Islam is wrestling with, uh, who is God? Uh, who is Jesus? So these, these are very much questions that the early church is wrestling with. And so there's a, I think there's a very good reason why the early church viewed Islam not as a completely new religion, but as uh, kind of coming at the tail end mm. of, these, of this long discussion that begins with the ministry of Christ about who is he and uh, what is this new revelation. In the early years, obviously, Christianity and Judaism um, standing off against each other and then various heretical positions, and then Islam is really kind of the, the capstone of those uh, discussions in terms of 
No, Jesus is only a prophet. God is not Trinity, uh, etc. Yeah, and that would explain why there are so many, when you, we dig into Islam, what they believe, there are a lot of parallels and similarities and even agreement in certain respects, but then obviously a lot of big differences. Exactly. Uh, can we trace any specific figures back, you know, people we might consider to be a solid Christian uh, figure and, and kind of trace a lineage from that person ultimately to what we consider today to be Islam? Yeah, John of Damascus, uh, this figure that I mentioned at the end, is probably the first cr key Christian theologian who has to respond to Islam. Um, his father actually had during the siege of Damascus in the uh, middle of the 7th century, had opened the city gates to the Muslims. His father was a presumably a professing Christian, and uh, there had been theological divisions within the Christian communities in what we now call the Middle East and Egypt over the Council of Chalcedon in terms of how did the natures within the person of one person of Christ relate to one another. And uh, the Chalcedonian perspective uh, had become the kind of orthodox view. And there were those in the Syriac church who dissented from that, as well as the Coptic and Ethiopic churches, and had per been persecuted because the, the state rulers of the what we now call the Byzantine Empire, which occupied this entire period, uh, region, um, uh, were committed to Chalcedonian Christology. And so they persecuted uh, the, the Syriac Orthodox Church based to some degree in Damascus. And uh, the Syriac Orthodox Christians there felt they might get a better deal from the Muslims. Mm. And so the city gates were actually opened by uh, John, John um, of Damascus' father. And John of Damascus um, served uh, in the court of the Caliph um, for a period of time and uh, then decided to devote his life to, the mo to a monastic lifestyle and retire to a monastery. But he, he writes uh, a major work against heresies, of which the last one is against uh, Muslims. Yeah, yeah. Taking a step back a little bit, you, uh, you talk about in the book that there was this uh, feeling that you had early on in your academic training and career uh, where you, you, you'd initially started studying the Church Fathers and the Patristics, and you felt the need to supplement your own uh, professional training, scholarly training, with uh, other areas of church history that might be more appealing uh, or more, uh, for lack of a better word, almost marketable uh, in terms of finding a job and, and what have you. Why do you think it is that uh, Protestants and evangelicals, Christians today, uh, sometimes are suspicious a little bit about the Church Fathers and uh, all that that would entail? Yeah, I think, I think part of the problem is uh, that uh, evangelicals have sought to live within the sort of uh, ethos of modernity. And modernity, uh, as it's developed in the 18th century, is very much anti-tradition. And um, the Enlightenment, which is the kind of uh, emphasis on reason as the preeminent arbiter of truth in the 18th century um, really brings into question the uh, embrace of uh, any intellectual position simply on the basis of the fact that this is the historical this is the historical perspective this is the the tradition as it's come down to us and therefore we need to pass it on um, and uh, the enlightenment raises all kinds of questions about that evangelicalism despite what evangelicals would like to believe um, is to some degree a product of that world. Mm. And our anti-historical anti bias, our anti-tradition bias, tradition, generally speaking, in our context is a negative word, um, I think has biased uh, us against then uh, the, the, the kind of pursuit of history, yeah. um, particularly the history that goes back to this very early period. Uh, and then I think, second, uh, the fact that the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox Church uh, d use the fathers to a large degree uh, also means that the, this period is suspect. So I remember writing, uh, being asked to teach a um, kind of a local church seminar uh, 
and uh, the I was to do three papers or three talks, and the pastor suggested, you know, asked me what I would do. So I, I wrote back and said, um, uh, why, why don't we do Perpetua, early Christian martyr, 202 roughly in Carthage, Cyprian, early Christian author, Gena martyr, uh, 258, and then Augustine. His uh, response, all three North Africans, his response was, well, two of those we've never heard of, <laughs> i.e. Perpetua and Cyprian, and the third, well, wasn't he a Catholic? Hmm. And I, I think this is pretty standard. And it's also standard on the other side. Like, so I've been asked by Roman Catholics, you know, how can I be a student of the early church and not be a Roman Catholic? Yeah. Uh, my response to that is kind of a very quip, uh, kind of a, an interesting quip, which is, Long, runs along the lines of, you know, how can you be a Catholic and st how can you study the other church and still be a Catholic? <laughs> because there are th certain things there that are solid, that are very much part and parcel of Roman Catholicism uh, that are not there in the early church. The, the strong Mariology, the papacy as we know it, uh, transubstantiation, uh, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So the fathers are sometimes criticized for their uh, quote-unquote allegorical interpretation of Scripture, and um, they would take a biblical story, often from the Old Testament, and, and read a lot of additional meaning into it, make connections from it, uh, often to Jesus and to other things uh, that we might today look at and, and feel like, oh, that feels a little bit creative, maybe to put it nicely. Um, how prevalent was that type of reading Scripture in the early church, um, it's 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 prevalent enough to give uh, Protestant exegetes at the time of the Reformation uh, cause to worry um, about the exegetical procedures or practices of the early church being a model to follow. Um, so Calvin, for example, on one occasion um, is going through um, Ephesians chapter. Three, where it talks about the length, the height, the breadth, and depth of the love of God in Christ. And uh, he cites Augustine's uh, reading of that text. And Augustine sees it as an emblematic of the cross, uh, the depth, the, the way in which Christ came down uh, to our uh, situation, uh, the height that God, the cross takes us up uh, to the heights of love, the, bre the breadth in which the gospel goes out to the ends of the earth. And Calvin makes the comment, you know, all of this is very nice and lovely, but what on earth does it have to do with the text? And, um, but the reality is uh, much more complex. So even a, a, a man like Origen, who I think is a remarkable exegete, um, when he can, he will always take seriously the historical uh, element of the text, the historicity of the text, unless, unless he feels that uh, uh, embracing the historicity of the, uh, the actual literal historicity of the text will endanger a, a true meaning, that it, it just doesn't seem to fit um, the larger scope of Scripture, in which case he then will have recourse to allegorization. Um, with uh, Origen, you again, you have to remember, uh, here's a man who was engaged in remarkable philological um, uh, work in trying to preserve the text of Scripture, the actual text of Scripture. He composes a thing called the Hexapla, six parallel translations in Greek, um, which is just a tremendous amount of work. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, for that day. And um, so, and then also allegorization, um, and if you look at the Puritans all the way through to, say, 19th century, something like Spurgeon, uh, they may claim they're sometimes doing typology, but it sure looks like early Christian allegorization. And um, uh, I, think, I think one of the things that uh, at least certain circles of evangelicals are starting, uh, have been doing thinking for a while now, is that texts have more than one meaning. And the historical grammatical uh, approach to Scripture obviously is not adequate in certain places. It's not adequate when you consider what Paul's doing in Ephesians 5, and he cites Genesis 2. Uh, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And Paul said, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the, the marriage. I'm talking about the church. But if you go back to the Genesis 2 passage, 
There's no evidence of the church, literally. A, a straight-up historical grammatical reading of that text doesn't give you the church. But that's why we need the, the New Testament. It gives us, gives us that uh, added perspective on the, on, the old, on the Old Testament. It's clear then that from the point of view of the authors of the New Testament that a passage like Genesis 2 has more than one meaning. Mm. Jesus uses it to defend um, uh, marriage against uh, remarriage or divorce, for example. You know, in the beginning it was not so when he defends uh, the permanency of marriage. Uh, and then P Paul uses it very differently. So here's a text that's really doing more than one. It's, it's got more than one meaning. And the fathers see that, and they, they, they feel that they have legitimization for their treat the way in which they treat Scripture in terms of allegory. Do you think there's anything that um, modern evangelical readers of the Bible can learn from uh, the allegorizing tendencies, even if we don't agree with everything that they would say, uh, that we can learn and apply in our own reading of Scripture today? Yes, I do. Yeah, for example, uh, during the course of the 20th century, um, the book of uh, Song of Songs, which is in the Old Testament, obviously, has been regarded primarily as just simply as a text dealing with human marriage. Um, what it's done is, um, and often sometimes in maybe a mild way, but sometimes very brash and, and almost uh, hubristic, um, it is rejected out of hand, uh, 1,800 years of Christian exegesis of that text, uh, beginning with uh, Hippolytus of Rome. We don't have his, his, his actual um, commentary on Song of Songs, but we know that he wrote one, beginning really then with Origen, uh, running through exegetes like Nyssa, Augustine, um, Bede, Bernard of Clairvaux, um, Luther, Calvin. Calvin never writes a, a commentary in the Song of Songs, but he boots uh, Sebastian Castelio out of out of Geneva for daring su to suggest that the the Song of Songs shouldn't be in the Old Testament canon because it's merely a love song. Mm. Uh, uh, Calvin obviously buys into that view. Uh, the Puritans, all the way through into the uh, the nineteenth century with Spurgeon, all of that is suddenly thrown out of hand. These people had no idea what they were talking about when they treated the Song of Songs as a love song between Christ and his people. And um, that's obviously, in my opinion, just wrong. It's wrong from, uh, from on a number of levels. It's wrong because it fails, I think it fails to understand the larger scope of Scripture, which is a marriage story. And you see that with, um, with uh, d the way in which Paul reads Genesis 2 in Ephesians 5 or the way in which we talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revel Revelation, or the fact that God talks about marrying Israel in Hosea. And so there is, there is this, this, this level. Um, I think where the, the fathers could be faulted, you know, when um, uh, kiss me with many kisses begins, you know, Gregory Nyssa will take this to mean the, the gifting of the Spirit. Um, uh, the allegorization of every little aspect of the Song of Songs is problematic. Um, but we certainly, we, I think we miss a lot when we fail to see that this, this song must have more than one reading. And um, we miss the fact that Jesus said all of the Old Testament speaks of him. So the Song of Songs somehow uh, has to be more than simply a marriage song. Um, it has to speak of, of, in some way about Christ. And so the patristic exegesis, while we may be able to fault it, uh, there, nonetheless, we can, we can learn from this sort of uh, approach to Scripture. So what books are considered Scripture? Uh, I think uh, the, they don't create the canon. The canon is created in the first century when Scripture is given. But the hammering out of dis the determination of which books should be in the canon um, is, in those patristic, is in that patristic period. And uh, that's an enormous gift. It's, it's always intrigued me that um, the two areas where you would think evangelicals would be in the foremost of scholarship, namely canon studies. Um, we have obviously a you know, remarkable uh, scholar like Michael Kruger working in that area. But there's not a lot. And then the other would be textual studies. And again, uh, a lot of the textual stuff that's been done on, at least on the one I'm most familiar with in the New Testament, has been done by men who would not be professing evangelicals. But you'd think that we would have gone into that with an enormous gusto because the determination of the text and what the exact text was 
it would, you would think it would be very important for people who confess inerrancy. So I think that's another key area, um, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So the Church Fathers are often associated with some of the early creeds of the Church. You mentioned the Nicene Creed. Um, what, are, uh, what would you say to the person who is listening and maybe feels a little bit skeptical about the creeds? And it seems like maybe there's a, a growing interest in them today, uh, but they wonder, why do we need these man-made, uh, admittedly man-written, non-inspired documents? And don't they sort of run counter to this principle of sola scriptura, or even just the sufficiency of scripture for life and doctrine? Well, for the very fact that Jehovah's Witnesses believe in sola scriptura. Mm. Elaborate on that. Well, they believe that the Bible alone is to be the basis for thought and uh, doctrine. So here you've got people who deny the Trinity, uh, who are heretical. Uh, they're not simply in error on certain uh, certain secondary issues or tertiary issues. They're in error on primary issues, mm. but they uphold the in inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible. So does that question then the sufficiency of the Bible? Um, the fact that we need creedal statements? No. Creedal statements are the way in which the early church found it necessary to, to summarize what, the, what the, the, the scope of Scripture says. So most of the early, early creedal statements deal primarily with God and the economy of redemption. And uh, the early church found it necessary over against various heretical positions, Gnosticism, for example, or uh, modalism, the denial of the distinction of persons, or Arianism, the denial of the full deity of our Lord Jesus, or Apollinarianism, the denial of the, the humanity of the soul of Christ, etc. Um, they found it necessary to, to, to create um, uh, confessions or creeds that summarize scripture, the scope of scripture. And the, the early church in many ways is, is a battle. The battles that take place in the early churches are, are battles over scripture. They're not, uh, they're not battles over philosophical positions. They're battles over, over the word of God. And by the time you get to the development of the creeds, like the Nicene Creed or the Chalcedonian Definition or the Apostles' Creed or uh, the Athanasian Creed even, um, you have a l you have a long decades of reflection about the large scope of Scripture behind that, and um, so the early church, in fact, from the very start, is confessional. You find embedded in the New Testament, First uh, John, if any man does not confess Jesus is the, is is the Christ come in the flesh, he's the Antichrist. Mm. So would you say that the kind of me and my Bible? I don't need these documents um, phenomenon that we might see today that we might be familiar with is sort of a, an actual new phenomenon that doesn't have a lot of basis in church history? Yeah, actually it is. I, I think the me and my Bible is a, is a product, again, of the Enlightenment, mm. of the questioning of all tradition, and these tr creeds are part of the man-made tradition. Um, it emerges in the kind of individualism of the West, the failure to realize that Christianity is a confession of a community, we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. For example, it's a, it's a communal confession. Uh, the early church would recite this confession communally. Um, yeah, I think the kind of me and my Bible are enough is actually a product to, to a large degree of a kind of Western uh, individualistic culture shaped to some degree by the Enlightenment. Um, in reaction, even rebellion against authority. Um, it's very interesting that all of the kind of major heretical movements that we've been plagued with in, uh, in America over the past 200 years or so, uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Christadelphianism, and certain wings of the Seven-day Adventists, they all grow up in the wake of the Second Great Awakening in a world of what we call Jacksonian democracy, where if a backwoodsman from Tennessee can become the president of the United States, uh, anybody can do it. And, and who are you to tell me, you know, I don't care whether you've been to seminary for, for six years and you've got this degree and that degree. I can read the Bible just as well as you can. And who are you to tell me what it, what it means? Yeah, yeah. And so we've, that, that attitude, interestingly enough, in fact, is not as biblical as they tend to think it is. You know, it's just me and my Bible. It actually is more a product of, uh, of a culture that prizes the individual over against tradition, over against authority, over against the learned ministry. Mm, wow, it's fascinating. Uh, 
so if there's someone listening right now who actually wants to take a stab at reading a church father for him or herself, uh, what would you recommend that person to start with? Um, I'd probably recommend Augustine's Confessions. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent kind of summary of how uh, uh, an early Christian found uh, God. Um, Augustine is a tremendous writer. You, you won't always agree with him. There'll be things you disagree with. Um, and because it's uh, an extended prayer, not an autobiography, it, it's got a rich spirituality here. The, the hung, his hunger for God comes through again and again and again. Um, other works that I probably would recommend would be the Letter to Diognetus, which is a um, Christian author. We don't know who it is. It's not Diognetus. He's the person to whom the letter is being written. And again, we don't know who he is. But he has asked three questions. Um, who are Christians? Why, why aren't you Jews? Um, why do you love each other the way you do? Um, uh, why has Christianity appeared now? And it, it's not ancient. And while his answers aren't uh, perfect, especially regarding why has Christianity appeared now and it's not ancient, um, nonetheless, you get, you get a very, very kind of bird's eye view of the way in which Christians viewed themselves as a distinct community, um, the way in which they sought to propagate their faith by love, as well as the proclamation of truth, and the way in which that community was grounded in the loving uh, work of God in Christ, God giving himself for our sins in the person of our Lord Jesus. Um, those would be probably two excellent texts to, to begin with. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, and yeah, worth, I'm sure those are fairly easy to find online, I would yes, think. Yes, uh, well, Confessions, you, there's, there's, a, there's probably three or four new editions that have come out in the last three years or so. Uh, the Letter to Agnes, you can easily Google it and uh, you'll be able to find it online. Yeah. All right, maybe last question. Uh, briefly, if you had to pick just one, who's your favorite church father and why? Uh, I, I think it would probably be Basil of Caesarea. Okay. Um, I did my doctoral work on Basil. He's a key figure in the defense of the, the deity of the Holy Spirit in the fourth century in the, the large controversy we call the Arian controversy. Um, after Augustine, he's probably the early Christian figure we know the most about because of an extensive, extensive collection of about 320 to 350 letters. There's about 380 actually passed under his name, but there's a, a number of them that are spurious. Um, there's a warmth there. Um, the importance of friendship is a very much part of his life. Uh, he's a mentor. Uh, he uh, is uh, very aware of the importance of mentors in his life. Uh, one of his mentors was a man named Eusebius of Samosata. Hardly anybody knows about him, but he's got 20 letters to him. Uh, no, we don't have any of Eusebius' letters, but it's quite clear the way in which Eusebius built into this man's life and enabled him to be the theologian he was, and I think that's very, very important in our day. Um, there's a humanity there about Basil, and uh, he's, he's been important to me on an existential level. Mm. in a number of ways. What do you mean by that? Like in terms of my own experience, uh, there was a very difficult scenario I went through um, probably about 30 years ago with the breakup of a friendship, a very close friendship. And Basil knew the same in his own life. And I was reading Basil at the same time in which uh, his mentor, one of his mentors, a man named Eustathius, Eustathius of Sebast, um, there was a break and it was a fundamental break that was never healed. And it had to do with Estadius' refusal to confess the full deity of the, s of the Spirit. And um, the way in which Basil responded to that was enormously helpful for me. And uh, despite the way that Eustathius slandered him, um, and it helped me think through and uh, really imitate to some degree. And I think one of the reasons why we, we, we read church history is for, for imitation. Uh, we don't, that's not taught today, but it, it's a very ancient view. Uh, all, all of the ancients, Christian, pagan, believe that, that history has value. One of the reasons it has value is because it gives us models for imitation, models to follow, models to avoid. And Basil is, has been such a model to follow. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank you so much for taking some time today to uh, share a little bit about your experience with church history, with the church fathers in particular, and the ways as you just just shared. They've impacted your life. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very much.
That was Michael Haken on the Early Church Fathers. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, Rediscovering the Church Fathers, Who They Were and How They Shaped the Church, available online or at your local Christian bookstore. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review, which helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.